All right, well, good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Amen, all right, we'll go over a couple of announcements. Um, first announcement is if you are participating in my project, which is awesome, because a lot of you signed up. If you're participating in my project, before you leave today, grab a questionnaire and a spiritual gifts test that I have back there. The questionnaire you'll fill out leave it anonymous and get it back to me next week or something like that. The spiritual gifts test you'll take and then hang on to it and we'll be going over it at our first Thursday evening meeting, all right? So make sure you get that before you leave here today. Um, also, youth group coming up, um, 23rd, we're gonna be starting our fall kickoff. The plan right now is still at Midway uh, for the drive-in, although I'll tell you the last two uh, weekends I drove by Midway, both screens were probably showing not youth group appropriate movies. So I'm, I'm going to be coming up with another plan just in case, just, just in case. I was surprised they generally don't have four rated R movies going. You know, there's usually one side that's a little more, you know, whatever. But anyway, we still got a couple weeks, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and then the 26th, Tuesday the 26th, we're still planning on doing youth group at the Haven of Portage County. More info will be coming out on that as well. Um, as far as prayers go, found out that Rick's mom passed away last evening. Yeah, she passed away. I got the message like around 1130 last night. So pray for Rick and his dad and their whole family. Uh, they're going to they're gonna miss Diane an awful lot. So uh, pray, pray for, uh, for them to be comforted and everything. Uh, going over our other prayer requests, John, your dad had his surgery last week? No. This coming week. Okay, this coming week. Yep. Any other updates or anything we should be praying for? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Else, Linda. Oh man. Russ. Oh yeah, Russ. Our buddy Russ here had an interview to be a pastor, to be uh, the the pastor at uh two small Methodist churches in the Newton Falls area last week, and they went very well. So pray for us and his interviews. That's great. Anything else? Dave. Oh, yeah. 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 Brooklyn is going to be going to the Thundering Herd of Marshall for a visit today, right? Why just... I got that right. Okay. Brooklyn looked at me like. Oh, is that the normal look? Okay, I got it. <laughs> yeah, fair. Fair. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, pray for Nolan. Nolan has been going through a lot of stuff. We don't have to, like, share it, but he's struggling. And he's looking for his way. So pray for Nolan. Yeah, big time. Yeah, Becky's son. Yeah, big time. All right, brothers and sisters, this is a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Why don't you stand with me and we'll open up with our responsive reading. Our responsive reading today comes from Mark chapter 12 and Romans chapter 13. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. 
Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in answering that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for having gathered us here in your house as brothers and sisters in the faith to give glory and honor and worship to you. Lord, we humbly ask that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would wipe us clean, that you would remove from us all of the the inadvertent and explicit times, Lord, that we have gone against you. We just simply say we're sorry, Lord. We repent and we'll do better. And Lord, you promise to forgive us of our sins, and we thank you for that, Lord. We lift up to you everyone that we're praying for today. We lift up to you Rick and his entire family on the passing of his mother, Diane. And Lord, the, if, there's any, if there's any comfort in this, it's knowing that Diane accepted you as her Lord and Savior and that she is with you this day and that one day our hope is that we will be united with her again in paradise. Lord, we pray for Rick's dad for his brother, for their children, for all the grandchildren, and just comfort them in the loss of Diane. Lord, we lift up to you uh, Sarah's Aunt Beth. We lift up to you Cindy. We lift up to you Mike Weaver, Lord, in his upcoming surgery. We lift up to you Nolan. Pray that you would bless and be with them, Lord. Let your healing hand be felt. Lord, we pray for Brooklyn, all of the other students that are going to be traveling to universities, Lord, that you would be guiding them and and opening doors and giving them the wisdom they need for the decisions that they need to make. Lord, we pray for Russ, who wants to be a fellow laborer, who is a fellow laborer in the vineyard, for the interview that he had last week, Lord, that if it's your will, the door be opened, and that you show him the way he should go. Lord, we pray, lift up to you all of the other uh, prayers that are on our hearts that have gone unspoken, for you know all things, whether we speak them or not. We pray for our church and for our congregation. We pray for our community. We pray, Lord, that you give us your church the wisdom and the desire to do your will, to follow your mission, to do what we are supposed to do, to share the gospel with a world that desperately needs it. Lord Jesus, we we pray for the gifts that we receive today, that they be given with cheerful and generous hearts, knowing that all things come from you and all things return to you. Jesus, we love you. We ask for this in your precious name. Amen. So today as we continue on in in this series, and we say that the series is on on servanthood, but the reality is that the series is, is on discipleship, right? Because servanthood is an aspect of discipleship, and that's what we're learning to do. And we're gonna be in John chapter 12, John chapter 12, we're going to read verses 20 to 36. We're going to really focus on verses 24 to 26 for the message. I titled this week's message, So What Do I Have to Do? Right? A lot of times someone will tell you, hey, I need this done. And the first question that comes out is, okay, so what, what am I supposed to do? Or what do I have to do? Servanthood, right? What is servanthood? Servanthood is really nothing more than, than following Jesus, right? We, we need to follow him. We need to be like him. And, and in fact, I was even thinking about this, and this one just kind of came up to me this morning. But before we read scripture, I want you all to challenge yourselves with a question. I, I want all of you, every one of you, even, you know, we got teens in here today, and we got little kids, but you know what? I'm going to take a guess that Violet and Harrison are probably just as slick upstairs as, as I am most of the time. So, I really am am, am going to challenge you all to ask yourself this question. Why do I come to church? Ask yourself that. Why do I go to church? Like, do I go to church because it's fun? Do I go to church because I'm friends with the pastor? Do I go to church because 
I get a couple of free donuts, no one's going to say nothing, and coffee. Do I come to church because it makes me feel good? Do I come to church because it's the cool thing to do? I, I, if those are some of the answers, I, I, I don't think you're, you're really going to church for the right reason. Because the real reason that we should be going to church, and, and if, if, you don't, if you don't feel this, be praying for it. But the real reason that we should be going to church is, one, to give glory and honor to God who deserves it, and two, to become like Jesus. Those are really the two reasons we should be going to church, right? Those are the two reasons we should be going to church. Reminded me a lot of, man, things just pop into my head. I, I wanted to play the drums when I was a kid, and my dad was a weirdo. And he said that before he would spend money on drums, I would have to learn how to play the accordion, which I don't, I don't know, because he played the accordion, and he wanted to make sure that I had the dedication to play an instrument before he played any, paid any money, so he got me accordion lessons. So I did not want to play the accordion, okay? I only did this because I thought it was going to get me a drum set. Knowing that, do you think that I really put my all into learning the accordion? No, I hated it. I hated every minute of it, right? I had this teacher, his name was Mr. Rice, who was not a very nice guy. He, I would always get there, he'd say, how much did you practice this week? And I would say, I practiced every day. All right, let's see it. And then I wouldn't do right. He goes, you didn't practice at all, I can tell, right? And, <sighs> maybe. <laughs> but, but honestly, I remember one day he called my dad and he said, Mr. Maltempe, you're wasting your money because he does not want to be here. He's only coming here because he has to. And I think, and he was right, by the way, and he was absolutely right. I think sometimes we approach going to church that way. Well, we only go because we think we have to. We think it'd be good for us. We think it's the right thing to do, right? We think it's the right thing to do. But as we're going to read today, following Jesus and becoming like Jesus, it's big. It's a big thing. So challenge yourself with that as we're kind of going through today's message. John chapter 12, starting at verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to, they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, no, it is for this very hour I came to this hour, for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. And the crowd that was there heard it and said, it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up, we have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is the son of man? And then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of God. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, bless and be with this place and fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit to make them tender to the leading of your word. And fill our minds and our ears with the Holy Spirit and make us attentive to your word, that we may learn your word that we may love your word and 
that we may live your word. We ask for this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. That verse is powerful. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will be. That's what Jesus is telling us. That's what Jesus was telling them, and that's what Jesus is telling us. Brothers and sisters, at times, at times, following has its privileges. And actually, I'm glad that Brooklyn's here today for the story that I found. I heard a pastor once tell the story of a young woman who wanted to go to college, but her heart sank when she read a question on the application that she had to answer. And the question was, are you a leader? Being both honest and conscientious, she wrote no, and then returned the application expecting the worst. To her surprise, she received a letter from the college that said this, dear applicant, a study of the application forms reveals that this year our college will have 1,000 452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we feel it is imperative they have at least one follower, right? (laughs) Sometimes it pays to be a follower. When it comes to your salvation, brothers and sisters, when it comes to your spiritual development, being a follower, being a Christian, a Christ follower, being a disciple is absolutely essential. You know, we've been discussing... um, what we're supposed to do in order to be disciples of Jesus and grow in our spiritual formation. And just like we talked about last week, whatever God's word says, I need to do, right? Last week, we looked at Luke 22 and what it meant to be a great follower of Christ. And we discovered that following Jesus's example and being obedient to his word is what it's all about. Brothers and sisters, Jesus talked the talk and he walked the walk And as disciples, we should know that following and walking have a lot in common. And if that we are supposed to follow Jesus, then we have to walk like Jesus walked. In fact, it's a must if you read the New Testament. In in 1 John 2, verse 6, John writes, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So what does walking like and following Jesus mean? mean? It's, it's actually interesting. We're going to go through what it means to follow Jesus. But remember that Jesus was a rabbi and his, his, uh, his apostles were students of his. During, and this was a form of teaching back then. This was a rabbinical school, essentially, that Jesus had set up with his apostles. The followers of a rabbi were called Talmuds. Talmuds were, were students that had been that had become students of a rabbi. Now, Jesus did things a little differently because generally students would apply essentially to a specific rabbi to see if the rabbi would take them on as a Talmud. Jesus did it in reverse. Jesus picked out the ones he wanted, which was not the way that it was typically done. But here's something that I don't want us to miss. In this time, the Talmud, the followers of the rabbis, we're not only supposed to learn what the rabbi taught. They were actually, their goal was to become like the rabbi, was to, be, to actually become like the rabbi, not just repeat what he said, but to become like him. In fact, there was an uh, a, a, a ancient Jewish historian, his name was Ben Sira. Ben Sira actually wrote that when a rabbi passed away, his Talmud, his students, should be so much like him that it would be as if the rabbi was still there. That's how much we're supposed to become like Jesus. That's how much followers of Christ should look like him and act like him and worry about the things that he worried about and have his heart focused on the things that Jesus' heart was focused on. So we all have a long way to go, right? Right? but this is the goal. This is what we should be doing. So what does it mean to follow Jesus? First, it means that we'll walk in a newness of life. In Romans chapter six, verse four, it says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like, that like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father, even so we should walk 
in a newness of life, right? This is the verse that I read when people are baptized. You're dying to yourself, and then you're arising to a newness of life. You're made new, right? The old is gone. The old is gone. I, I tell the story all the time. Um, maybe 12, 13, 14 years ago, I don't remember, Lori bought me the very first iPod Touch. I loved it. It was a teeny tiny thing. It was apple green. I absolutely loved this thing, right? I had music on it, all this stuff. Well, guess what? When phones started getting all of the stuff that was on the iPod Touch, but the iPod Touch only had music, I didn't use it anymore because something better had come along. So now I got rid of it and I carry something else, right? That's the way it is when we come to Christ. What, what was there before, that, that should be gone. What's now is new. So first, we walk in a newness of life. Secondly, we'll walk in holiness. First John chapter one, starting at verse six, says, if we claim to have fellowship with Jesus, yet walk in darkness, we lie and we don't live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. This is one that I see a lot if you go look on social media. I'm telling you, just go out there and look a little bit. You'll see stuff on whatever, whatever is hot now, whether it's Snap or this or that, whatever, up in the bio, you know, Romans, whatever. I love the Lord, living for him. And then you go through the pictures and you're like, I think there's a disconnect. There's a little bit of a disconnect over what's going on, right? Or I see people even like, you know, all tatted up with Bible verses. It's good, but what's going on if we're not living in it, right? If we're not living in it, we're, we're called to be holy. We're new creations. We're purified by his sacrifice. We ought not walk in darkness anymore. We shouldn't be doing those things anymore. We should know better. I'm reminded so often, and I think I've shared this story with you before, but my dad always used to hire um, immigrant families um, at the restaurant, especially teenagers that were going to North High School. He would get them through the International Institute. They, we were one of the places that they knew they could come and apply and they could get like their first jobs and everything, right? And I remember I was, I don't know, 14, 15 years old, and he hired this kid who was my age from Vietnam, I think his name was Twa, and we were um, busing tables, and at one point, we're carrying stuff to the back, and I saw Twa take a half of a hamburger that was uneaten in the bus tub, and he started eating it. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And he goes, this is good food. Why would we throw it away? And I, I, call, I told my dad, I said, Dad, Twa's eating out of the garbage. I didn't know about stuff like this. I, I was in Talmadge by then. We didn't have anything like this going on. And I remember at the end of the night, my dad made him a couple of hamburgers, and before he left, he gave them to him. He said, Twa, don't eat out of the garbage no more. You're in America. You left what you left, right? That's the way it is when we come to Christ. We left what we left. Why would we keep going back to it, right? We're new creations. We should be living differently. We should be living... Uh, we should be walking in holiness. Third, we should be walking in love. Ephesians 5, 2 says, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What that verse means is that our whole manner, everything about us, our desires should change, right? As sinners, we walked in selfishness and in pride and in arrogance, but now we're new creations and we should be walking in love. And, and walking in love is the evidence that we really are new creations. Do you know why? Because love is not natural to the sinful man. L love, is, love is unnatural to us, right? Love is unnatural to us. That's why in the animal kingdom, animals don't love each other, right? They don't, they don't, they, they can't comprehend that, right? But we can when we have Christ. We're new creations. We have a, a new, new natural condition. So we walk in love. Number four, we walk by faith. Second Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Brothers and sisters, faith is something 
that each believer has, but there are some that are given special endowments of faith. It expresses itself through a deep abiding conviction that God is sovereign and in control of your circumstances. It expresses itself in a deep awareness that you are not alone. And that gift enriches, should enrich the body of Christ because your faith as a gift becomes contagious to help those around you who are inclined to look at their circumstances instead of the solution. And the solution is always the presence of God. My wife, for those of you that are in the study, they're going to take the spiritual gifts test. You'll see this. But my wife has a, a huge gift of faith. In fact, I'm going to touch on it here in a second. It's also called the gift of encouragement, right? This gift of faith. Lori is never rattled. And, and, I'm, and I'm glad that I have Lori there because I'm easily rattled. That doesn't mean I don't have faith in Jesus. I love Jesus with all my heart. But I'm nervous. Lori is not. When all that news came down about my job, Lori was like, I'm not even worried about it at all. She's been unflappable. She's the one who actually pulled me into the room to say, look, we have an opportunity here to be an awesome example to the kids. So keep it together. <laughs> And it was good words from her because it's just a reminder. Her faith strengthens my faith, right? And that's how it should work. Everyone has multiple spiritual gifts. You'll see that for those of you taking the test, you'll see that. I, I'm strong in the gifts of administration and teaching and prophecy. And one thing about overseeing a church or being a pastor of a church is in one way or the other, you're also kind of, you're always addressing kind of big picture needs. And that tends to wear on a person. And if you're not careful, and it happens all the time, you can see all sorts of studies on it, pastors often lose heart, become discouraged, become overwhelmed. So if you're one who scores high in the gift of faith, who scores high in the gift of encouragement, right? Even in the Bible, we had those, Paul's buddy Barnabas, right? The apostle buddy Barnabas. Barnabas was not his real name. Barnabas was the name he was given. It means son of encouragement, Barnabas, right? Son of encouragement. People with that gift help those who have different gifts. Help those to encourage their faith. You help us to walk in, in confidence that Jesus will build his church, that God is participating in our lives. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, it tells us in Hebrews 11. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Brothers and sisters, as we follow Jesus, we will learn to trust God more to direct our journey. I, I came across and remembered this, this example. You know, the wars of the past, uh, 50 to 100 years, have left a unique danger in many parts of Asia. Countries like Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, the Philippines, Still to this day, thousands of people are killed and maimed because of disregarded landmines. They're just, they're all over the place. In fact, for any of you that remember, Princess Diana was big on this when we were little, trying to get these things addressed. But when the landmines were first put in place during these times of war, there were maps and grids that were made so that someone who was in them could negotiate their way out or could go back and remove them, right? But those maps have long since disappeared. But there's all sorts of stories of people getting trapped in landmines and someone coming along with the map and helping the person who was trapped navigate their way, walk their way to safety. Now, I'm gonna tell you this, brothers and sisters, if you were to find yourself caught in a landmine, and I know that when I came across this, this is now one more phobia that I have. I don't know when it would happen, but if you were caught in it and you didn't know where to turn, Imagine the faith that you would have to have in a person with a map who's telling you, take four steps this way, take six steps this way, right? An incredible amount of faith. But here's the reality. In our lives, we have landmines that come up in our lives every single day. And if you pay attention to those landmines, it can literally paralyze you because of how many things you have to be worried about. But in our lives, do you know who has that map? Jesus does. And we need to cling to him because he's faithful. He doesn't worry about the tumultuous times. 
He doesn't worry about the, the landmines or the traps or anything else. We cling to him through faith because we know that and we know him. I still remember, I know Dave and I almost at every phone call, Dave's repeated to me on, on every phone call what my professor said uh, the day that I lost my job when I messaged him. And it's very comforting when he said, Vince, rest assured, this did not surprise God at all, right? That's what we cling to, that he knows those things. So we walk by faith. Fifth, we walk in wisdom. Colossians 4, 5 says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. This verse, brothers and sisters, gives us clear reason that we are to walk in confident wisdom. It's our first proclamation, really, of the power of the gospel, that what you are and what you do and what you speak have big ramifications. I came across this awesome story. This is a great story. Does anyone here know who Bill and Gloria Gaither are? Like the Gaither Gospel Hour. They sing lots of songs, right? They're really good. You should look them up. A lot of the songs that even we sing, they're from the Gaithers and you all don't even know about it, okay? Just big Christian. Um, for little kids, if you ever watch that, cartoon, that animated movie called Hoodwinked, right? The, the, the Little Red Riding Hood. Bill and Gloria Gaither's son played the part of Jephthah the talking, singing goat. So I don't know. I don't know how I know that, but I do. Uh, little side note. But I, listen to how cool this story is. And all of us have experience with stories like this. Bill and Gloria Gaither had been married or had been, had been a married couple. It says we were, this is from his book, actually. It's a quote. We were teaching in school in Alexandria, Indiana, where I had grown up. I wanted to buy a piece of land where I could build a house. I noticed the parcel, that there was a parcel on the south end of town where cattle grazed. And I learned it belonged to a 92-year-old retired banker named Mr. Ewell. He owned a lot of land in the area. And the word was that he would sell none of it. He gave the same speech to everyone who inquired. I promised the farmers they could use that land for cattle. Gloria and I visited him at the bank. Although he was retired, he spent a couple hours each morning in his office. He looked at us over the top of his bifocals. I introduced myself and, and, and told him I wanted to buy the parcel. He said, I'm not selling. I promised it to farmers for grazing. I know. I responded, but we teach school here and thought you'd be interested in selling it to someone planning to settle in the area. So with his lips pursed, he said, what did you say your name was? Bill Gaither, he replied. Any relation to Grover Gaither? He said, yes, Grover was my grandfather. Mr. Ewell put down his paper, removed his glasses and said, interesting. Grover was the best worker I ever had on my farm. Full day's work for a day's pay. So honest. What did you say you wanted? And I told him. Let me do some thinking and then come back and see me. I came back within a week and Mr. Yule told me he had the property appraised. I held my breath. How does $3,800 sound? Would that be okay? If that were the price per acre, I would have to come up with $60,000. $3,800, I repeated. Yes, 15 acres for $3,800. I knew it had been worth at least three times that. So I accepted. Nearly three decades later, my son and I strolled that beautiful lush property that had once been pasture land. Benji, I said, you've had this wonderful place to grow up through nothing that you've done, but because of the good name of a grandfather you never met, right? It speaks words, it speaks volumes, your actions. Brothers and sisters, ask yourself today, what does your reputation say about you? What does your reputation say about you, right? You need to ask yourself that. Colossians says that we're to walk in wisdom. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, says it this way, walk worthy, walk worthy of the one who called you into his kingdom. Those who follow Jesus walk wise. Those who follow Jesus walk in a worthy manner a manner worthy of associating your name with God's name. Walking in a worthy manner and having that understanding should bring us to our final element of what it means to follow Jesus. We walk in faith, we walk in love, we walk in holiness, we walk in wisdom. But lastly, we should be walking in the fear of the Lord. Acts chapter nine, 
Verse 31 says, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church multiplied. Have you ever heard of the term of calling someone an empty suit? Have you ever heard of that term, calling someone an empty suit or a paper suit? It means that the person looks the part, but they fold or they vanish under, under heat and pressure. There's nothing to them. The reality, I think, brothers and sisters, is if Christians would practice spiritual disciplines, the spiritual disciplines of prayer and study and worship and fasting and service, perhaps there wouldn't be so many empty suit Christians who disappear and they have to undergo any kind of hot experience or any kind of calamity. On too many occasions, we fear people or events. We fear God. We melt under stress and temptation. Yet the fear of the Lord all through scripture is a common characteristic of everyone who follows him. And that should change us to make us more like him. Brothers and sisters, we must never begin to think that following Jesus is a casual thing. We must never think that following Jesus is a casual thing. We must not think that following Jesus is a take it or leave it proposition that you can turn it on again or turn it off again, right? You can't have a mentality that says, I would follow Jesus more if. I would follow Jesus more if they were doing things that I like to do. I would follow Jesus more if they were singing songs that I like to sing. I would follow, you can't follow Jesus that way because you're not following Jesus that way. You're following yourself. Really, you're following yourself. We must remember that following Jesus comes with responsibility and accountability as much as it comes with privilege and blessing. Fear of the Lord should produce obedience to the Lord. Sometimes I struggle with with Christian lifestyles or Christians on TV who make Jesus sound like an old my buddy doll from when I was a little kid, right? Or or a cabbage patch kid, right? Just this, this object that I can drag around wherever I'm going, slap him on the back, kick back a cold one, light up one with him. That's not Jesus. That, that, there's nowhere in scripture where it looks like that. When we follow Jesus, there should be a, a sense of holy reverence and submission that accompanies that relationship. And it's not done in a bad way. It's done out of love. I, this, this always reminds me when I talk about this, when we were building our house, we had, we cleared like literally we cleared like 800 trees from our lot, okay? And Gramp cleared all of them just about with a chainsaw. And we had people there helping, right? So there was one Saturday and, and Gramp said, we gotta get done. I mean, this had been going on for like six weeks. And Gramp said, this Saturday, we gotta get done. So see who you can find. So I told two of my buddies at work, I'm like, guys, can you please come and help me? Because Gramp really, we gotta get done. And they were like, okay, now, these guys know me, right? They know me. And what I mean by that is that when they showed up, they showed up with like a cooler that had some beers in it and a bunch of sandwiches and whatever. And like, yeah, we're gonna clear some trees today, right? So they get out of the car at eight and Gramp was in charge. And I was head down the whole time. Like I was just, he's cutting and I'm moving and he's cutting and I'm moving. About two in the afternoon, Paul and Chris, they sit down. And they're like, dude, what is going on? You haven't sat down all day. I'm like, dude, we sit when Gramp sits. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't mess around, right? And at the very end, we cut trees till seven o'clock. And we did, we, I think we had like a 10 minute break to eat a sandwich. At seven o'clock, Gramp goes, good job, guys. We're all done. These guys, they're, they're sweat through. My buddy Paul comes up to me. He's like, dude. I'm 36 years old and your grandpa made me feel like something's wrong with me. I'm like, I know. And then Chris said the truth. Because Chris said, when you said, come over to help trees, we thought it was like you running this job. We didn't know it was gonna be actual work, right? I was around my grandpa. If I'm following, if I'm following Gramp, I'm not gonna keep acting like myself. Because you know what Gramp's gonna say? I don't need you here, get, go, right, go. 
If you're going to be here, then be here. If not, go. But I think sometimes we think we can follow Jesus and we can just do whatever and that Jesus is always going to be like, yeah, however you act is fine. Just That's not the way we follow Jesus. That's the way you follow yourself and then put Jesus's name on it, right? And that's not what we should be doing. Anyone here like uh, Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, The Chronicles of Narnia? There's a great line in that movie that, because you know Aslan rep- represents Jesus in that movie, right? There's a great line about Aslan, because everybody loves Aslan, right? And all you want to do is hug him. Everybody who knew Aslan wanted to be around Aslan, right? Everybody. But do you remember what the Be- Mr. Beaver, I think was his name? Was his name? Do you remember what Mr. Beaver said about Aslan? He looked at at Lucy or one of the girls and he said, Aslan is good, but he's not safe. He's to be feared and revered and awed, right? Jesus is good, but he's not safe, right? Jesus is good to those who love him, who place their faith in him, right? And he expects that from us. So now we have the six characteristics of those who follow Christ, who walk with him. They walk in a newness of life, They walk in holiness, love, faith, wisdom, and fear of the Lord. So ask yourself this as we sum this up. Do those traits describe you? If you're following Jesus, they do, or they should, even in small examples, right? I can see some of this in my life all over. I'm not really good at any of it, but I'm trying. And every day I'm trying. And the goal is to get a little bit better every day. That's what spiritual formation is. That's what spiritual development is. And keep in mind, brothers and sisters, it's possible to stray. It's possible for us to neglect our walk. And when we do, those six characteristics will start to wane. But I want to encourage all of you today, brothers and sisters, sincerely take an inventory of your life and check and see with yourself, am I walking worthy of God? Because at the end of the day, Whatever God's word says, I must do. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, be with us this day and help us, Lord. It's hard to follow you. On our own, it's impossible to follow you. So strengthen us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Draw us close to you, Father God. And help us to understand that our goal in this life is to become more like you every single day. Jesus, we love you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us the desires of your heart. And we ask for this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Brothers and sisters, have a great day. God bless you all. Stay close to Jesus and Lord willing, we'll see each other next week.